Double Identity, Chapter 19. I look from my cousin to my aunt. That is, assuming they really are my cousin and my aunt. Assuming I can believe anything I've been told since I left Pennsylvania three days ago. Jess, you aren't supposed to say anything about that, Marley says. Not until I have a chance to ask Walter. What, you have to get his permission to talk? Joss asks. I promised I'd protect Bethany, Marley says. She's only 12. Same age I was when I lost my entire family, Joss says. You still had me, Marley says. I might as well have lost you too, the first year or so. I know, I was kind of emotionally absent. I'm sorry. They have a strange way of arguing, their voices getting softer and slower instead of louder and angrier. Their points of view getting closer together instead of farther apart. But it's like they've forgotten I'm even there. What are you protecting me from? I demand. Marley and Joss look at one another, and Marley says, says, I don't know, Marley says apologetically. Your dad said to keep you safe, and Thursday night I thought that just meant the basics, food and shelter and compassion while your mother was having a breakdown, I say, going crazy. Marley frowns, but she doesn't correct me. Why was Elizabeth's last name different from mine? I persist. She had the same last name as her parents, Marley says. Elizabeth Kroll, Walter and Hillary Kroll. Their name is Cole, I say stubbornly. Cole, you heard me say that on the phone Thursday night. It didn't register then, Marley says. Cole and Kroll sound so much alike, and I was feeling a little overwhelmed. I didn't know you had a different last name until Friday at the Y when you spelled it for Ronald Bosford's mom. I want to ask your dad about it before I say anything to you, just in case. But I haven't had much of a chance to talk to Walter, so I was going to be, she glares at Joss, discreet. Joss ignores the glare and leans forward. Why would Aunt Hillary and Uncle Walter change their name, she asks. Bethany, as far as you know, has your last name always been Cole? Yeah, I say, but suddenly I'm not so sure. I squint, trying to focus on a vague memory of being a little kid sitting in too large, too stiff a chair in front of a too cheerful man in some official place, a bank or an insurance office, maybe a car dealership. The man's handing my dad a stack of paper saying, I think that will be everything, Mr. and Mrs., he said, Cole, or has it been Burns or Stern or something like that? I think, I tell Merle and Joss. Uncle Walter and Aunt Hillary using an alias, that's kind of hard to imagine, Joss says. I turn to Merle. Don't try to protect me, I say. Tell me the truth. The truth is, I haven't understood anything about Walter and Hillary since June 13th, 1991, Merle says. She holds her hands out, palms up, in a gesture of innocence. I'm as puzzled as you are. It's impossible not to believe Merle. It's impossible to look at her kind, troubled, sympathetic face and not feel a little comforted, even if I do feel like I've been zapped into the twilight zone. A name's a pretty basic thing, Mom and Dad, I think. Why wouldn't you even tell me about that? Well, Joss says, because we've all fallen silent, staring bleakly at the cake we no longer have any appetite for. Where's Uncle Walter's phone number? I'm going to call him right now. Clear this all up. He didn't leave a number, Marley says. Bethany and I are just supposed to wait for his calls. Joss lets an expert snort. Come on, Mom, she says. You are a lawyer's wife. Were you worried about liability issues? At the church, we have to have people sign all sorts of legal forms just to leave their kids with us for a couple hours of preschool twice a week. Uncle Walter gave you Bethany for who knows how long, and he didn't leave you a phone number? If there was an emergency, you wouldn't even be allowed to authorize medical treatment for her. You know me, Merle says. I wasn't thinking about liability. I was worried about Hillary and Walter and Bethany. Merle reaches out and puts her hand on my shoulder draws me towards her. She's my aunt. Joss is my cousin. I'm sure of it. But the longer I'm in Sanderfield, the less I know about my parents. Chapter 20. Merle releases me from her hug. She and Joss carry off plates and glasses, scrape our happy big cake slices into the trash. They stand at the sink, washing and drying dishes. I don't move. I'm frozen in place at the table. Joss comes and sits across from me. She lowers her head so her eyes peer directly into mine. What can we do, she asks. How can we help? Find my parents, I want to say. Make them act normal. 
Make them tell me the truth, the whole truth. Give me answers. I remember that Joss claims to know more about questions than answers. I swallow hard. Tell me the rest of your story, I say, about you and Elizabeth making up your personality profiles for the Olympics. Joss looks relieved that I'm asking for something she can deliver, or maybe she's just happy that I'm still capable of talking. I can do better than that, Joss says. I can show you the profiles we acted out. We begged and begged and forced Dad and Uncle Walter to tape them. I'm sure Mom has some of those tapes around here somewhere. A shadow of something like doubt crosses her face. That is, if you want to see those tapes. I do, I say, with more certainty than I feel. Ever since Merle told me about Elizabeth, I've avoided asking to see so much as a picture of her. Even though I'm sure Merle has some of those lying around her house somewhere too. And now I'm agreeing to watch a video of her walking and talking fully alive. Be strong, I tell myself. And it bothers me that those are the same words my father used. The videotapes, it turns out, are in the closet of an unused bedroom upstairs. It takes all three of us to shift around the dusty boxes, dig in past the fraying cardboard flaps. While we're looking for the tapes, we find one whole box full of Joss's old gymnastic trophies and ribbons. You are such a star, Merle says wistfully, a touch of awe in her voice as she stares down at those still shiny statuettes. You could have gone to the Olympics. It didn't matter to me after the accident, Joss says impatiently. It wasn't worth it without Elizabeth. I feel like I'm hearing a replay of an old argument. Elizabeth must have had a box of trophies like this too, I think. Wonder what mom and dad did with them. I think about our many moves. We had boxes that had just traveled from the attic in one house to the basement of another. Were some of those boxes full of Elizabeth's belongings? Would I have found out about Elizabeth all by myself back home if I just showed a bit more curiosity, nosed around a little? No, I think bitterly. Mom or Dad would never have let me out of their sight long enough to discover anything on my own. Still, I suppress a shiver that I might have been so close to everything Elizabeth left behind, just one floor away my entire life. Joss pulls on a box that promptly tears apart in her hands, spilling out old-fashioned videotapes. She barely manages to catch the monstrous old-style camcorder that slides out of the top, top box. Good grief, Mom, Joss says in exaggerated disgust. Didn't you ever read the passage in the Bible about not storing up your treasures where dust and moth can consume them? Yeah, Miss Smart Mouth Preacher, and I know the point of that passage is about aiming towards heaven, not spending a fortune at the container store, Merle says, giving Joss a playful swat on the shoulder. This is my childhood, disintegrating before my eyes, Joss says, still in a tone of mock disgust. I'm glad you can joke about these things now, Merle says softly, turning towards Joss. Their eyes lock, and I feel like I'm an outsider again for a moment. I can only guess at the undercurrent of emotion beneath their banter. If I had a childhood like Joss's, with the same tragic end, would I want to keep all those mementos? Joss glances my way, then back at her mother. Seriously, Mom, you should think about transferring all these tapes to DVD before they completely fall apart, she says. You're welcome to take on that chore, Merle says. I'm too busy feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, preaching to the non-believers, Joss says. Especially Mr. Use, used a lot of words today. And I've got my hands full right now, trying to teach Anthony Dolan the alphabet, Merle says, grinning. Maybe I can make the DVDs for you, I say. And the other two turn to me in surprise. I swallow hard. I mean, if I'm here very long, I could. I'm actually pretty good with electronics. And then I proved my boast by being the only one who can figure out how to hook the camcorder to the unwildly old VCR that Merle also has to dig out of the closet. It makes me feel smart and capable and in control for the first time since I left home. Ah, the wisdom of the younger generation, Joss jokes, born with a remote control in each hand, what would we do without you? We couldn't watch these videotapes, that's what, Merle says, setting into the corner of the couch. You could have just asked one of your kindergartners to come over and set up everything for you. Offer them extra credit, Joss says. And have them find out how stupid I am, Merle says. No way. The joking stops as soon as I cue up the tape we've plucked out of the box labeled 1990. Merle inhales sharply, and Joss clutches her hand. Behind the flashing block showing the date and time, 
2.04 p.m. August 5th, 1990, there's a man on the screen. He's a few inches too short to be proverbially tall, dark, and handsome, but he's nice looking in a middle-aged kind of way. He's sitting on a couch reading a newspaper. The Sanderfield Report, I notice. Dad, Joss explains, unnecessarily. Tom Wilker doesn't seem to know he's being taped. He turns a page of the newspaper. Here we are, a girl's voice whispers out from the range of the camera, in a manner of nature documentaries, stalking the rare creature, Nazarus Sanderfilius, in his native habitat. The sound is so distorted, I can't tell if the voice is Joss or not. Do people sound the same at 11 or 12 as they do as adults? You do, Fist, another voice says. He's not in his native habitat. We're at Grandma's, and he's not just rare. He's unique, one of a kind. He's the only sitting mayor of Sanderfield. All the others would be Mayorus, Sanderfilius, and Myrderus. Somehow I know this is Elizabeth. Her voice even sounds a little like mine when I'm being smart alecky. Would that change if he stood up? Get it? Sitting mayor? Standing up? Is that Joss standing up to Elizabeth? Both girls crack up, their laughter providing a kind of soundtrack as Tom lowers the newspaper and smiles towards the camera. Hi, girls. What are you up to? He asks lazily. A man who doesn't know he's got less than a year to live. Since all you adults are too busy to tape us, we decided we'd tape you, Joss says on the video. I was such a brat, the adult Joss says beside me. How'd you guys put up with me? We loved you, Merle says. Yeah, but why was I a brat on tape, Joss asks. This might ruin my chances of ever being elevated to Pope. You're not Catholic, Merle says, laughing. I guess they've gotten over the shock of seeing their deceased husband father on the TV screen. I don't know how they can joke around like that, and I missed some of the conversation on the tape. Yes, this is manipulation and blackmail of a public official, Elizabeth is saying now. What are you going to do, arrest us? No, I'm going to... Tom lunges towards the camera, his face suddenly eerily large. Then the view swings around wildly, showing first the wood panels on the floor, and then the maroon walls and white ceiling. Steal the camera from you and film the best darn Olympic profile ever. The screen goes black. He fell for it, Joss says. She has tears in her eyes. He always was a soft touch. For you, Merle agrees. Picture reappears on the TV screen. This time it's two girls in red and white and blue leotards, standing on their hands in a huge expanse of grass. Joss and Elizabeth, one dark haired, one blonde. I can't see their faces because they have their backs to the camera, but I can tell how muscular their arms and legs are. They're perfectly matched and perfectly still, like statuettes, their toes pointed to the sky. I'm supposed to read this, Tom's voice comes from behind the camera. One of them must have said yes because he clears his throat and launches into In tiny Sanderfield, Illinois, population 8,500. Hey girls, you shouldn't make that 8,501 because Jody Smuckers had her baby last night and Daddy, the voice is dim, but the outrage is clear. Okay, okay, I'll just go on. He makes his voice sound pompous like a TV newscaster. Two girls, cousins, and best of friends showed athletic promise at a very young age. Elizabeth Kroll turned somersaults in her crib. Jocelyn Wilker began practicing cartwheels at age three. And now, after years of hard work and dedication, they're fulfilling their early promise at the Olympics. The two statues, gymnasts, explode into motion, turning the handstands into back walkovers, roundoffs, leaps, and spins. Aren't they amazing, folks? Tom Wilkins asks. The screen goes dark again, and then the scene changes. The camera is moving towards the house. The very house I'm sitting in now, I realize. But the house looks different because it's summertime on the screen and everything is green and lush. A riot of petunias and marigolds and pansies and geraniums line the sidewalk and spill out from hanging baskets on the porch. The two girls are in shorts and t-shirts now and they're swing sitting on a wicker porch swing hanging near the front door. I feel a pang remembering how the first night I imagined the porch as a setting for an early 1900s happy family movie it had been the scene of happy times, but it had been the late 90s. And the happy family had been Joss and Elizabeth, Merle and Tom, Mom and Dad. We caught up with the two girls recently at their grandmother's house to talk to them about their brilliant careers, Tom narrates as he walks the camera up the porch steps and towards the girls. Hi, girls. Hi, they both say. 
There's a scraping noise that must be Tom pulling up a chair. The camera zooms in and goes temporarily fuzzy. How the two of you get interested in gymnastics, Tom's asks. Well, we always liked being active. It's Elizabeth's voice. The camera zooms in closer, swinging even further out of focus. Our mom started us in dance lessons when we were three years old, but that was so sedentary. I hear Jess giggling in the background on screen. Elizabeth pauses to glare at her cousin, then goes on. Then in 1984, I don't hear the rest of what Elizabeth is saying because the camera is finally in focus. Elizabeth's face fills the whole TV screen. I can see every freckle, every light hair on the eyelashes and eyebrows, and the freckles are just like mine. A light smattering across the bridge of her nose, a few more on the right cheek than the left. The eyelashes and eyebrows are just like mine, wispy and hard to see. The nose and eyes and mouth and heart-shaped face structure are the same too. The only way I can tell I'm not just looking in a mirror is that Elizabeth isn't wearing glasses and she has braces on her teeth. I got my braces off last year. I gasp. Merle reaches over and takes my hand. Should we stop the tape? Joss asks. <clears throat> no, I murmur weakly. This isn't too strange. We're sisters, I tell myself. Sisters look alike, like Mom and Merle, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen from the old TV show, Full House. Okay, they're twins. How about my friend? But I can't think of any friends or even acquaintances who look so much like their sisters. Elizabeth and I are identical, except for the glasses. Look how much Elizabeth is blinking, Merle says. Remember how determined she was that those contracts were going to work out? Oh, I think, and it's like I've had yet another bombshell dropped on me. But I force myself to keep watching the TV screen, and I notice a few small differences. Elizabeth has a tiny scar just above her lips that gives her whole face a mischievous look. Her eyes light up and she bounces in her seat when she talks, as if it's impossible for her to keep all of her energy and enthusiasm bottled up. I don't think I've ever looked that self-confident and unguarded, even in the days before mom started crying full time. And what do you like to do in your spare time, besides gymnastics, Tom asks from behind the camera. Oh, we don't have spare time, Joss says, and Tom swings the camera toward her. We don't even have time to do our homework, except in the car on the way to gymnastics. It's always practice, practice, practice. We have to work really hard. <clears throat> Up close, 11-year-old Joss's face shocks me nearly as much as Elizabeth. Joss looks not just smaller and younger, but in unformed somehow, as if the pieces are going to come together to make the grown-up Joss aren't all there yet. Her dark eyes seem a little vacant, and she seems to be trying too hard to be enthusiastic and peppy as Elizabeth. Yes, we do practice a lot, but I have other interests besides gymnastics, Elizabeth says, and Tom focuses the camera back on her. I like to run and paint and read and watch TV and go to movies. In fact, when I grow up, and I'm too old to be a gymnast, I'm going to go to Hollywood and be a set designer. Either that or a rinketer, that's someone who tells stories. Beside me, Joss laughs. I'd almost forgotten how much Elizabeth liked using big words that nobody else knew, she says. I mean, ranked her from a 12-year-old? Merle chuckles too, and neither of them seem to notice that I've gone stiff with horror. I'm the one who wants to be a movie set designer, I think. I'm the one who likes to collect unusual words. In fact, ranketer is exactly the kind of word I would have added to my list, though it's ruined for me now. Is it because Elizabeth and I were raised by the same parents, I wonder? Did they do something to make us both of us love words and movies? As if on cue, I hear my mother's voice from the TV. Girls, where are you? She calls in the distance. Time to go home. And here are the parents of the two gymnastics prodigies, Tom says, turning the camera towards mom's voice. Walter and Hilary Kroll and Merle Wilker and her husband. Hmm, can't think of where her husband could have gotten to. Tell the viewers of America, what's it like to have such talented daughters? Exhausting. I think that's Merle's voice, but once again, the camera is taking a long time to focus, so it's hard to tell. Three blurry people are stepping out of the front door onto the porch, one tall, two short. And then the focus finally kicks in, and I see my parents and Merle as they used to be. They all look so young, it's tempting to think of them as kids as well. None of them have any wrinkles. Mom and Merle both have blonde hair, as radiant as Elizabeth. 
My dad isn't stooped over at all, but stands tall and straight and proud with a full head of longish, sandy-colored hair. An older, white-haired woman joins them at the door. The real Merle, I think. But no, it's the grandmother passing out goodbye hugs and calling out, come for Sunday dinner next week, too, same time. I hear Elizabeth off camera asking, Mom, can Joss come home with us? And then Joss complaining, Dad, you don't need to tape this. The profile's over. Oh, all right, he says agreeably. And the screen goes black, then turns to fuzz. The real life, present day, adult Joss sighs behind me. I wish he taped it all, she says, every single second. She hits a button on the remote, shutting off the TV, and the three of us blank, resurfacing from the past. <clears throat> Chapter 21. We don't really talk about the video. Merle and Joss seem a little lost in their memories, and I'm struggling to act normal while carrying on an internal debate. She didn't look that much like me. Yes, she did. No, she didn't. Want to play cards or something? Joss finally says. Merle and I both shrug. But that's all the encouragement Joss needs. She pulls out an Uno Rubo attack, the old fashioned card game jazzed up with a little robot that shoots out cards when you least expect it. I played it a few times at friends' houses, though all we have at home is the original game. I thought you were crazy when you gave me this last Christmas, Merle says, pepping up a little, but it's actually a pretty fun game. After a few rounds, all three of us are much more energized throwing down the hit four robo scum cards with great relish. Merle is even laughing again. When I was a little girl, my great aunt Agatha would have been scandalized by the notion of playing cards on Sunday, she says, and with a minister, no less. Your great aunt Agatha obviously had no sense of humor, Joss says, and no appreciation for the importance of playfulness in God's world. She hits the button on the top of the attack robot and groans when it spits six cards at her. Appreciate playfulness, remember? Merle taunts her. She frowns at her own handful of cards. Sorry, Bethany. This is the only green card I have. She puts down a zap hit fire card, which usually would mean that I'm at the mercy of the attack robot, too. Oh, don't be sorry, I say. Save your pity for yourself. I lay down my own throwback attack card, which makes her not me the robot's victim. <clears throat> Great play, Joss Crows. She throws her arm around my shoulder, as if the two of us are ganging up on Merle. Oh, Elizabeth, she says, it's no, so nice having you back. I've missed... She gets a stricken look on her face. You, she finishes lamely. All three of us freeze. The attack robot's eyes flash red and green and yellow, like some malfunctioning traffic signal. Stop. Go. Caution. I wish we could pretend I didn't say that, Joss says quietly. I know you're not Elizabeth. I'm sorry. The attack robot hums at us. Joss and Merle stare at me, their expressions mirroring one another. Mixtures of regret and compassion and confusion and fear. Am I really that much like her? I ask forlornly. Yes, no, Merle says at the same time that Joss says, no, yes. They look at each other and shrug. You saw the video, Merle says apologetically. There is a strong resemblance. It's like, you know how things look different when you look at them out of the corner of your eye instead of straight on, Joss says. Out of the corner of my eye, you are Elizabeth. Same features, same expression, same person, but straight on, you're different. You're a lot quieter than Elizabeth, Merle says, more self-contained. Elizabeth could be such a spaz, Joss says, hyperkinetic and so sure of herself. I'm going to be in the Olympics. I'm going to win more gold medals than anyone else. I'm going to be the most famous gymnast ever. She was ambitious, Merle agrees. Hillary was like that too as a child. And then when Elizabeth was born, she transferred all of her ambition to her daughter. She glances towards me as she wonders if she should have said that. I am also Hillary's daughter. I think back to the years before my mother cried full time. Was my mother ambitious for me? <clears throat> oh honey, don't worry about it. You're doing the best you can, she'd tell me when I was little and couldn't quite manage to color inside the lines. You don't need those friends. You've got mommy and daddy, she'd tell me in third, fourth, and fifth grade when I fretted about my ranking in the various popularity contests of school. Let's just stay home together, she'd say when she suggested. I was going just about anywhere. The skating rink, the zoo, a play. If I pushed at all, she'd give in, but I had to push. 
My mother isn't ambitious for me, I think. She's done everything she can to hold me back. I shove myself away from the table and the Uno attack robot and Merle and Joss. I don't want to play anymore, I say, sounding just like a spoiled little kid. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. That's fine, dear, Merle says. I'll see you tomorrow, Joss says. Good night. They watch me climb the stairs. I know they will talk about me after they think I'm in bed, out of earshot. I'm tempted to creep back down to the landing, press my ear against a wall, and listen out of sight. Instead, I pull my pillow over my head and clutch it tightly to my ears so there's no danger of any sound leaking in.